Illinois faces some big challenges. Today, you're about to hear a truly honest analysis of the problems we face. Equally important, you'll also hear an in-depth discussion of some practical solutions. This is your radio source for stories, the insight, and the answers you won't hear anywhere else. Not on the media, and not coming from Springfield. You're listening to Illinois Rising, presented by the Illinois Opportunity Project. Now, here's your host, AM 560's Dan Proft. Welcome to another edition of Illinois Rising. I'm Dan Prof, co-host of Chicago's Morning Answer on AM560, weekdays 5 to 9 a.m. with Amy Jacobson. And joining me is Pat Hughes, who's the co-founder of the Illinois Opportunity Project and president of the Liberty Justice Center, instrumental in the Janus decision that was before the Supreme Court, uh, decided by the Supreme Court uh, at the end of last month, changing the political landscape in this country. Uh, speaking of the Supreme Court, this week, uh, the future of Roe v. Wade has become a hotly debated topic again with the elevation by President Trump of D.C. Appellate Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh to be his nominee to replace Anthony Kennedy on the high court. And uh, boy, what a contrast. It couldn't, uh, in the against the backdrop of Illinois, where this same week you had uh, Illinois News Network report that for the first six months of 2018, uh, taxpayer-funded abortions in Illinois increased 274% as compared to this time last year. This is after Governor Rauner broke with all 73 members, Republican members of the General Assembly, and voted to be the first governor in U.S. history to sign legislation that provided taxpayer funding for abortion on demand all nine months of pregnancy. That's what he did. And in case uh, any conservatives or pro-lifers or common sense center rightists were confused about that, the governor doubled down on HB 40 through his campaign this week, reiterating his support for legislation. He came up with all kinds of conflicting rationales to defend after telling members of the House and Senate Republican caucuses that he would veto that legislation if it reached his desk. Yeah, Dan, I'll be interested to hear what our next guest uh, says about the idea that the reason why HB 40 was so important is because it would preserve Roe versus Wade in the state in the event that Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed and the court actually did overturn it, which I I still think is unlikely even with uh, Kavanaugh. But that's what he's touting publicly, that, look, I preserved your Roe rights here in Illinois. And it's interesting because there was another Supreme Court case that didn't receive the fanfare of uh, Janus or the uh, uh, immigration cases uh, for obvious reasons, uh, seminal cases, but an important free speech, freedom of conscience, First Amendment case decided by the high court last month was the uh, California case, Nifla v. Becerra, where the court held that right of conscience trumps a requirement by the state government in the in this case california to compel individuals that run crisis pregnancy centers to refer potential clients to abortion service providers well in illinois governor honor signed legislation that would effectively do the same thing that eliminated the right to conscience here so you would think with the uh, decision the court made in the California case that uh, the legislation Ronner again signed here would be invalidated. But for more on this topic, we're pleased to be joined by State Representative Peter Breen, who is the House Republican floor leader in Springfield. He's a Republican from Lombard. He's also a constitutional attorney in his uh, other life. And he joins us now. Peter, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Hey, glad to be with you guys. So let's start with the uh, numbers of taxpayer-funded abortions in the first six months of this year, uh, up 274%. uh, Probably not a surprise. If you finance something, you get more of it. Absolutely. And and the numbers you're seeing are very preliminary. There's a three-month delay in reporting from our managed care organizations. There's a six-month allowance for Medicaid claims to be put in. I'm actually just, when I run my numbers, I think this is actually going to be 10 times the numbers you're seeing now, just off of these preliminary numbers. So you're beginning to see this issue. Uh, And in the other states that have gone down this road, usually they've been done by uh, their state Supreme Court mandating it, uh, or they had abortion legal prior to Roe. Uh, You're going to see a lot more of this. 
Uh, and I hope that these numbers will help us to build the coalition we're going to need in the legislature in future years to defund this program of taxpayer-funded abortions, because that can be done by the General Assembly. This HB 40 business uh, doesn't mean you have to then turn around and fund the program. Peter, the governor said when he signed HB 40, and he said it again this week, that uh, a big part of the reason why the law was so important was because it preserved the rights of women uh, to have an abortion, even if Roe versus Wade was overturned. And then, of course, the governor emphasized that, saying he supported the Kavanaugh pick, but that he, his law here would protect women's rights in Illinois. Is that really the way the legislation was drafted? And, and were, were women's rights to an abortion ever at risk in Illinois? It seems to me they, were not, they, were, they weren't regardless of HB 40. And, and, and this, this, is a, this is a common misconception by, or, or it's a misstatement by abortion supporters that somehow, with or without Roe v. Wade, that the law in Illinois would change. Look, I, and I, I have a little more hope for uh, Judge Kavanaugh uh, than you do, uh, Pat. I, I think that, that Roe is pretty much done. Uh, at some point, it will, whether it's being eaten away slowly or what have you, we're going to be in a post grow era for the country. But for Illinois, I mean, we have much more fundamental issues, which is you know, how do we deal with taxpayer-funded abortion and what have you. In the HB 40 debate, that whole Roe v. Wade thing was a smokescreen to put through the tens of millions of dollars that will eventually be flowing to Planned Parenthood and other abortion industry uh, players. So, I mean, that, that's really the purpose of HB 40 was to get tons of money to the abortion facilities uh, across the state. You know, you've seen Planned Parenthood say they're going to put another four clinics uh, opened up in Illinois. But, yeah, the, the, the Roe v. Wade thing was a total smokescreen. Well, um, you... Um... Uh, are challenging HB 40, not just uh, kind of theoretically through the legislative process and funding, as you described, is you're also challenging in a court. And I wonder if you could give us the status on that. Yeah, and we've argued that case. Uh, we argued in uh, early June to the 4th District Appellate Court two claims there. One was a, an effective date argument, which is a bit more of a technical argument. Uh, we've seen in, in, uh, throughout, uh, the, particularly in recent years, uh, the Senate Democrat president, uh, uh, John Cullerton has been holding bills and playing legislative games, so we're, we're, uh, we're trying to, to put a stop to that through our first claim in that case. The other claim, though, and probably more important for the people uh, generally, is that if the General Assembly doesn't estimate the revenues as they are required to under our balanced budget requirement in the Constitution, well, then they can't spend the money. Uh, and we've already seen that in the most recent spending bill where you know, the General Assembly spent every penny of the new 32% tax increase and $1.2 billion more. That should not be allowed under our state constitution, under a reasonable reading of it. So we, we've brought the, the cases about HB 40 and the abortion funding, but the principle is much broader. Uh, it's really about fiscal sanity for the state. Well, and this is sort of what I was referencing when I talked about common sense center-rightists at the top. You could be pro-choice and say, as many pro-choice are, say, well, I, but don't force me to pay for uh, that decision. And you're talking about an open-ended and entitlement program that's in the tens of millions of dollars you described uh, against the backdrop of a state with $250 billion in debt and uh, you know, 5 to $7 billion in unpaid bills that are, that are due state vendors. So uh, the, um, the, the recklessness of this fiscally is uh, uh, an important part of it. Absolutely. And we just got an order this week uh, saying that the state needs to pony up, I believe, about $400 million to state workers who uh, were allegedly underpaid for the last uh, three or four years. Uh, you know, and of course, that money's not been appropriated, so it really should not be paid out. But that was an additional offense on top of everything else that we just are. are you know, some folks had a very strong moral objection, but certainly an even uh, you know, more of the electorate was looking at it going, why are you spending my money on things that are elective by their definition? They're, they're not something that we are expecting to pay. We don't expect to pay at a national level. And, and throughout the country, most folks in most states are adding reasonable regulations to the abortion procedure. Here in Illinois, we've been rolling them back. Uh, and so that we, we're really going against the grain of the country on our abortion policy, in right. addition to many of our other policies. Yes, very much. Um, let me get, get to also a status check, what you th or your, your interpretation, really, of that other decision I mentioned that came down from the Supreme Court of the United States with respect to right of conscience. 
how will that impact the law that Governor Rauner signed back in 2016, essentially infringing upon right of conscience for uh, workers at crisis pregnancy centers and the like in Illinois? Right. I mean, and, and so to me, the core principle of this case out of California, the, the California law certainly is drafted differently than Illinois, but the intent was the same. It was to, to shut down pro-life uh, and it really to force pro-life doctors and uh, pregnancy centers to become advertising, advertising agencies for local abortion facilities. And so on that principle alone, our law, at least as to those uh, highly objectionable uh, portions, our law should be struck down. I was really disappointed to see the Attorney General Lisa Madigan immediately on the day of the decision say, uh, California law had nothing to do with ours. Uh, you know, we're going to, our law continues. Uh, and, and that just seems like such a, you know, she was putting her head in the sand on this uh, and, and possibly triggering a need for us in, the, in Illinois to go up to the Supreme Court to, uh, to get a correction there. But we've got cases pending in both state court and federal court that are now going to start back up. Um, I would say any any reasonable attorney general would have said, hey, let's let's read the decision. Let's try to apply it here and get to a settlement. Instead, they're going to waste your taxpayer dollars. And uh, uh, the Thomas More Society is probably going to get an attorney fee award against the state of Illinois. All right. He is State Representative Peter Breen, House Republican floor leader, Republican from Lombard, also a constitutional lawyer, lawyer with the Thomas More Society, as you just mentioned. Peter, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you, guys.